Number five on this list is the Jin, an ancient demon whose main method of attacking people was to trick them. History collection says the Jin or Jin of Arabic and Islamic mythology closely matched the original classic daemon or demon. Neither good nor evil, the Jin were supernatural spirits born of smokeless fire long before the creation of humanity. The Jin were spiritual beings, formless shapeshifters with magical powers who are ranked somewhere between between humans and angels. They were not immortal and humans could kill them. However, a long lifespan compensated them for these disadvantages. In Persian mythology, the Jinn had their own land, Jinistan, whose capital was the City of Jewels. However, the Jinn also haunted the human world with favorite places of residence being the desert as well as rivers, wells, and even marketplaces. In this sense, they are very much like the Roman Jenny Loshi spirits of place and it was customary to ask the local jinns permission before drawing water or even traveling into alien territory. If they appeared before humans, the jinn could appear as animals, monsters, or people. Whatever form they took, people could quickly identify them by their flaming eyes which were also vertical rather than horizontal. This unusual attribute gave the jinn a sinister appearance that married well with some of their more suspect traits. For although the jinn could be helpful, Helpers, they were also known to be malicious tricksters. In the worst scenarios, they would raise storms and cause disease, insanity, and death. Islam teaches that every human has an evil jinn whose sole purpose is to tempt its human opposite into evil. This reputation for malevolence is compounded by the fact the chief jinn, Iblis, is also known as Azazel, the Islamic devil. So, yeah. I don't think summoning these guys is the best plan. You could literally release a massive disease on your whole city or something like that. Also, you need to be extremely mentally stable and strong to not get tricked by these evil things into doing something that you don't want to do. Speaking as a pretty gullible individual, this would really not be a good idea for me. Number four on this list is the Yao Guai. Unless you want your literal life force to get eaten, I wouldn't summon these demons. History collection says the Yao Guai, or strange ghosts, or strange devils, were mythical Chinese demons who, like the Azura, desired immortality and godhood. They included in their number animal spirits such as the fox spirits and fallen celestial beings. However, even though they acquired their powers through the practice of Taoism, the Yao Guai cared little for the balance between light and dark. They were firmly on the dark side and would stop at nothing to achieve their goals of deification. They believed they could accomplish this goal by consuming the life force of holy men. One tale of the Ye Guai appears in the 16th century Chinese novel Journey to the West. The story tells of the pursuit of the holy man Yao Xiang by Bei Gu Zhong or White Bones Demon. However, unfortunately for Bei Gu Zhong, Yao Xiang was traveling in the company of Sun Wukong or the Monkey King. The company first encountered the evil spirit disguised as a young girl searching for food. However, the monkey king saw through the demon's disguise and drove it off with his staff. The Beigu Zhong tried again, firstly disguised as an old woman and finally as an old man. This final time, the monkey king killed the demon, revealing its true form, a skeleton. Staffs, however, were not the only way to deal with these demons. As they lived in the underworld, the Chinese believed they were afraid of the light. So bonfires, fireworks, and torches were the perfect way to keep them at bay. So if you summon this thing, you may not even know that you have because it could appear as something else entirely. So, unless you have the awareness and power of the Monkey King, which, no offense, I kind of doubt you do, this demon will probably end up getting the better of you. Number three on this list is Baylor. Baylor was said to be the chief of a demonic tribe in Celtic culture. He and this tribe threatened the Celtic people with death and destruction constantly. It was also a pretty actionable threat because Baylor was a literal giant. So he and his tribe could obliterate any human resistance if they so chose to do so. His overall strength and size wasn't his best weapon though. His best weapon was his eyeball. His eyeball was said to be poisonous. If Baylor glared at anyone with this evil poisonous eyeball, then they would die right there and then. That is a pretty ridiculous power and 
kind of OP if you ask me. Now the good thing about this is that legends say Baylor was defeated by his grandson. There was basically a lot of drama and his grandson fought him and took him down. He was never actually killed though. Legend says that he slunk away to the sea and he still resides there to this day. Summoning this demon is clearly just a horrible idea. Not only would you die the second that you summoned him because his eye, but everyone around you would die pretty soon after that too. Just think about the damage a demon like this could cause in a big city. Like, we'd have no way of defending ourselves. Hopefully, my dude stays in the sea for good. Number two on this list is the Shadim. These were ancient demons associated with destruction and human sacrifice. The history collection says, To the Mesopotamians, the Lamasu or the Shedu were powerful, human-headed, eagle-winged guardian spirits of the home home or the state. The Mesopotamians erected statues of these powerful entities who had the body of either a bull or lion at the gates of palaces or cities. There, they were well placed to ward off invading armies and ensure peace to those within the city walls. In ordinary households, images of the Shedu were carved on clay tablets and buried under the threshold to ensure peace and happiness within. When the Israelites encountered the Shedu, however, they interpreted them in a very different way. Some of them took up the Mesopotamian custom of worshipping them, hence disapproving references in the Old Testament to how such people sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Now, to the Jewish mainstream, the Shadu were false idols that possessed statues and masqueraded as gods. As such, they were evil, and so became the Shadim, demons associated with destruction, illness, and human sacrifice. So I guess if you were Mesopotamian, then you could summon these guys and it'd be all good, but if you're anyone else, Probably not a good idea. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not trying to deal with a demon full of destruction and illness and just bleh, don't want to handle any of that. So, no thank you. Not trying to get sacrificed today. Number one on this list is Allah. So instead of reaching for a nature valley bar, this demon would grab the occasional child when she was hungry. Just great. The history collection says Allah is a female demon from Eastern Europe who, like many demons, seems to be derived from a belief in nature and weather spirits that could cause disaster and disease. Allah was believed to reside in clouds, lakes and springs, or remote mountains or caves, or in large trees. When she visited humankind, she could take many forms. Allah could manifest as a vast black wind or a female dragon, a large mouth human or a raven. She could even possess people. All or any of these relate to Allah's primary characteristic, all-consuming greed. If angered, the demon could manifest violent, thunderous hailstorms to destroy fields, vineyards, and orchards. However, it was equally likely she would satisfy her enormous appetite by devouring the produce herself. And when not over-consuming stolen grape or grain, Allah also liked to snack on her greed was so insatiable that she also periodically tried to eat the sun and the moon, therefore causing eclipses. So not only could you or your get eaten if you summon this thing, but you might also cause the entire world to end if this demon decides that she's hungry enough to chow down on the sun for good. Also, how big would this demon need to be if she was about to eat the entire sun? Like, that doesn't even make sense to me. Either way, never summon this demon because the human race could literally be at stake if you do. Number five on this list is the Shadow Doll. Whatever demon took up residence in this evil-looking doll was not one that the Warrens were too fond of. Scare Street says, The Warrens' files do not state why this horrible doll was created in the first place. However, they do state that it was used in satanic rituals and it was created by black magic using human and animal bones. It's rumored that if a picture were to be taken of the doll, it would project itself into the dreams of the person who dared to look at it in the eye. However, it is not only a simple dream. 
The dream would be so intensely nightmarish that the victims would either suffer from a heart attack or forever be frightened of sleep because of the horrifying looking doll. The files even state that there were a few deaths caused by it. The shadow doll was later found in an antique shop and oddly enough, a couple purchased it. After the purchase, the couple began to encounter the eeriest of nightmares. They later found out that they were experiencing the same nightmares of the cursed doll and that the husband had scratches all over over his back and neck which could only be traced back to the shadow doll. Clearly this doll and its capabilities was something that the Warrens were very concerned about. It's one thing to be attacked when you're awake and conscious. Let's face it, this happened to the Warrens all the time and they were constantly having to deal with scary demons coming after them. Obviously this was never a great time but it was something that they could handle. Getting attacked while you're asleep though. That's a completely different animal. You are now being haunted in a world where things won't make any sense. A world where this shadow doll can manipulate the physics and do things that they wouldn't be able to do outside of our heads. It also meant for the Warrens that they wouldn't have one another. They were a team and tackled every single one of their demonic foes as a unit. Getting attacked while you were asleep in your brain meant that the other person, even though they would most likely be lying right next to you, they'd have no idea that you're getting attacked and wouldn't be able to do anything to save you. All of this is why the Warrens had to take this doll and bring it to their museum. This was of course after they performed various ceremonies on it to try and extract the demonic presence. Number 4 on this list is the Amityville Horror House. This is the case, the demon, the haunting, that launched the Warrens to stardom. But don't think that it didn't come at a cost. Pop Sugar says, The demonologists became a household name for the supernatural after their involvement in the infamous Amityville House. The scary elements of this story really began in 1974, when 23 year old Ronald Defoe Jr., one of the children of the Defoe family, murdered his two parents and four siblings in their sleep. The house was empty for a year, but George and Kathy Lutz eventually bought the house for a very cheap price of $80,000. The couple and the children only stayed for 28 days after seeing slime ooze from a wall and a red-eyed pig creature among other disturbances. In addition to these occurrences, George saw his wife levitating and said that he woke up at 3.15 every day, the time when Defoe killed his family. The Warrens came in and determined that there were psychic troubles even before the notorious murders. A demon was in this place causing problems. The Warrens knew it and they had to deal with it. Now I don't think that the demon can be blamed for everything that went on here. At the end of the day, murder is murder and I don't want to take anything away from that. But after the fact, this place was susceptible to being haunted and a demon definitely came in here and haunted it pretty well. It's their most famous case for a reason. Number 3 on this list is the Enfield Poltergeist. The Enfield Poltergeist was a possessive demon who specifically targeted two young girls. MovieWeb says, this well known case formed the subject matter for The Conjuring 2. This case saw the Warrens flying overseas to London, England in order to investigate alleged poltergeist activity in the North London borough of Enfield. Peggy Hodgson, a single parent, had initially called the police after two of her four children had reported knocking sounds on the walls. Peggy herself claimed to have witnessed furniture moving around with no explanation. This was apparently also corroborated by a police officer visiting the house. Ed and Lorraine Warren were convinced that the events were of supernatural origin and appeared to be predominantly focused around two of Peggy Hodgson's teenage daughters with the girls seeming at times to apparently levitate off the ground. So like I said, a demon who really enjoyed possessing people. These are some of the most dangerous types of demons because you simply don't know who or what to believe anymore. If you're living in a house that's haunted, then how do you know that your dad, for instance, is who he claims he is? How do I know who to trust? Also, I am just as susceptible to being taken over by this creature and I can't imagine that that's a great time. It's easy to see why Ed and Lorraine Warren were scared by this demon. Number 2 on this list is the Annabelle doll. One of the most famous demons that the Warrens ever encountered, Annabelle certainly gave the pair many sleepless nights. The story behind Annabelle starts with a girl named Deidre, who got the doll as a gift from her mother. 
It was a nice gift at first, but it wasn't long after she had it that she started noticing some weird occurrences. She would leave the doll in one spot, and then when she came home later that day, sure enough, the doll had moved somewhere else. Pretty creepy. This was creepy to begin with, but it gets a lot worse. One day she came home and noticed that the doll was covered in blood. It was at this point where she decided to seek a professional opinion. She seeked the help of a medium to get advice. Scare Street says the medium told her about a little girl named Annabelle Higgins, who was once a happy child playing in the fields until her life mysteriously ended. After her death, she roamed the buildings that were built on this field. One night, her boyfriend, Cal, woke up to see Annabelle shocking him. It was awfully strong. Another night, Annabelle had attacked him and left him with seven bloody scratches on his chest. They decided to contact their local priest, and that was how the Warrens heard their ominous story. The Warrens delivered the victims a shocking truth, saying that there was no Annabelle and it was a mere trick from a demonic spirit which was allowed to manifest the doll after their agreement. The Warrens told them that the spirit was given permission to inflict harm on them and that if they had remained silent, the spirit would have killed them all within a week or two. They held an exorcism and took the doll with them. Whilst driving though, Ed lost control over the car for a few times and the priest who had made fun of the doll was killed in a dreadful accident. Disturbed by the doll, the Warrens decided to keep it in a sealed box. This thing almost took Ed Warren off the road and could have ended the Warrens' lives prematurely. Safe to say that they feared this steam in a decent amount, I think. And finally, number one on this list is The Conjuring House. The famous Ed and Lorraine movie was based on fact, folks, one of the scariest run-ins the pair had with a demon. Movie Web says, The house in question, located in Harrisville, Rhode Island, is said to be haunted by the ghost of a woman alleged to be a witch. The commonly accepted story states that the woman killed her son and herself in order to haunt any future occupants of the house. The Warrens' investigation took place in 1974 when they made repeated visits to the property in order to investigate reports of a malevolent entity capable of lifting beds, whilst also filling the air with the reek of rotting flesh. This particular was of course the basis of the first film in the series, The Conjuring. While Ed Warren had already passed away during the production of the movie, Lorraine Warren served as a consultant on the project. Of that long ago investigation, she admitted the things that went on there were just so incredibly frightening, it still affects me to talk about it today. Literally, Lorraine, when she was alive, was still affected by the things that went on in this house. It's no wonder that Hollywood saw this as a prime opportunity to make a movie and rake in the money. The original story was just so scary to begin with. Coming in at number 5 we have Ross Island. Located on an island in India closer to Southeast Asia than India, the island is known for beautiful beaches, unique marine life, coral reefs and largely undisturbed forests. But beyond the islands beautiful views and stunning wildlife lies a dark past. Ross Island is one of the 572 islands that make up the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Now the island is is a ghost town where the remnants of a 19th century British settlement lie in ruins. In 1857, reacting to an unanticipated Indian revolt, the British Empire chose remote islands as the site of a penal colony. And Ross Island was one of them. The British first arrived in 1858 with 200 Indian convicts. The deadly task of clearing the thick jungle fell upon the inmates, while the officers stayed on the ships. Moreover, the development and town built at Ross Island began in 1858 and the prisoners were forced to build its buildings. The island was transformed to resemble a British town, with houses, offices, clubhouses, bakeries, stores, churches and everything else that the British would not miss when they were away from home. The British ruled Ross Island for more than 80 years up until nature was against the development. In 1941, a gigantic earthquake affected the island and left the town on the island completely ruined. The British thought rebuilding the town would not be worth it and overnight left the island in complete ruins. Abandoned in the 1940s, the island is now being reclaimed by nature. Homes, a massive church, ballrooms and even a graveyard all are in varying stages of decomposition, being taken over by an unyielding forest. In at number 4 we have Tlingua, Texas. Near the Mexican border, you'll find the town of Tlingua, Texas. In the 1800s, it was discovered that the area in which Tlingua was built was plentiful in cinnabar, a red mercury sulfide, from 
which mercury can be extracted. This caused an influx of miners to the area, but it wasn't until Jack Dawson's discovery and production of the area's first mercury in 1888 that it drew a population of 2,000, and by 1900 there were four mining companies in the area. When the Chizos Mining Company opened in the mid 1800s, workers and their families quickly relocated to the Tolingua, Texas. The Chizos Mining Company was founded and began operations in 1903 near Tolingua, Texas. The company specialized in the extraction of quicksilver and mercury. In 1799, Charles Harvard discovered that compounding the element produced fulminate mercury crystals, establishing its marketability. These crystals are useful in the production of gunpowder cartridges and shells. Mercury production had peaked during the First World War but began to fall, thus Chiso's mining company had filed for bankruptcy and the miners began to trickle out. When the mine went bankrupt in 1942, Perry sold it and moved away. The population was around 3,000 at its peak, though it said that everyone up and left the municipality in the 1940s once the mercury was picked through. Thus, the once busy city became the ghost town we know today. It is now home to 110 people. By the end of the war, it was an abandoned ghost town. In at number three, we have Kennecott, Alaska. A once flourishing town with businesses, shops, a train, and a lively community is now left as a ghost town. The town of Kennecott in Alaska was flooded with people after copper was discovered in 1900. After the discovery, a group of wealthy investors formed the Kennecott Copper Corporation to mine the mountains above the Kennecott and Root glaciers. In the 27 years the mine was in full operation, the company and town grew significantly in fortune and people, and at its peak Kennecott employed 600 people. But by 1938 the copper was mostly gone, the mine was shut down and the town was left abandoned. The town was abruptly abandoned by its citizens, leaving most of their possessions behind. Since the middle of the 1950s the place had been completely deserted, with the railroad discontinued service that same year. Reports of ghosts along the abandoned tracks of the Kennecott train have been claimed for decades, while other visitors report having seen old tombstones along the route of the tracks. Though the gravestones then vanish by the time the visitors make their return trip. Others have reported hearing disembodied voices and phantom children laughing. Reportedly a 1990s construction project were halted after workers were scared away by the creepy sounds and unexplainable events. In at number 2 we have Exunan Tunich, Belize. I hope that's how you say it. Deep in the jungle of Belize lies an ancient ruins of an abandoned town that has been left to crumble. The town has been left abandoned for over 1,000 years, though before the abandonment of this large and populated town, Exuna Tunich was a thriving metropolis. The first construction at the site dates back to sometime in 200 AD, with the growth of the town continuing until its final days of functioning as a city. The town grew to consist of many temples and palaces, including its largest and most recognizable known as El Castillo. Exuna Tunich has lied abandoned since around 1000 AD. It is thought that due to consistent devastating events such as an earthquake and other natural disasters, caused a sudden evacuation of the large Mayan city around 700 AD. The disaster caused extensive damage to the main pyramid of Exuna Tunich. Although the city was reoccupied some time after, it only remained active for another 300 years before it was left completely unoccupied. After abandonment, the site remained empty, eventually being encapsulated by the surrounding jungle and nature until it was rediscovered by explorers in the early 1890s. The name Exuna Tunich comes from the ghost stories that have haunted the ghost town for years. The ghost story of Exuna Tunich is rumoured to start in 1893 after the first sighting of the ghost happened. The first ghost sighting goes as one morning a man who was part of a research team working on the site saw what he described as a Mayan maiden ascending the staircase of the Exuna Tunich's main pyramid. This vision caught him by surprise so he continued to watch as the woman walked further up the stairs. Suddenly she stopped and turned to look at the man where he was able to get a glimpse of her glowing red eyes that pierced his soul. She then turned to continue her climb to the top of the pyramid where she would disappear amongst its stone columns. The shocked man quickly assembled a team to search for this woman, yet no trace of her was ever found. Since this sighting, countless more visitors have reported to also spot the ghostly maiden who haunts Exuna Tunich. She is always described to be ascending El Castillo's stairs. To this day, the sightings and reports from visitors continue. The ghost frequency is what gives Exuna Tunich its name, which translates to the Stone Lady in the Maya language. Some believe that this Maya maiden have 
formerly lived within the city many years ago. Others believe that she was a human sacrifice, trapped to relive her last moments of ascending to the top of the pyramid where her ritual would have been conducted. Then there are a few who believe her to be some sort of ancient godly spirit linked to the site and the Mayan culture. And finally, in at number one, we have Calico, California. The ghost town of Calico can be found in California, midway between Barstow and Yermo. The beginning of the town started in 1875 and was built under the impression that there were prospects for silver in the Calico Mountains. But in the spring of 1883, many of the local miners left Calico when borax was discovered three miles east at Borate. Though Calico again boomed in 1884 as additional silver discoveries were made. Gaining a population of some 2,500, the town supported two dozen saloons and gambling dives that never closed, as well as more establishments such as the church, public school, dance school, and a literary society, along with dozens of retail businesses. By the late 1800s, Calico was bustling with prospectors searching for their their fortunes and the Calico Mining District became one of the richest in the state. Calico's final decline began when the price of silver fell in the 1890s, but the brake production kept it alive, even through the panic of 1906. They tried to hold on and borax for a time substituted for the shiny metal that had been the Calico's fortune. Calico kept churning out valuable minerals until it finally exhausted its supply in the 1920s. Calico was soon abandoned and left to gradually decay in the desert sun until little remained, but in 1951 it was purchased by the Walter Knott, an ex miner, and rebuilt as a modern ghost town. He restored the town to mostly how it was, in certain cases, rebuilding some of the old structures as they were back in the 1880s. Considered one of the top haunted locations in California, Calico has its fair share of ghost stories, when one of the most active and known ghosts of the abandoned town is Lucy Lane. Lucy is often seen in a black lace dress walking back and forth between her home and store. Others have allegedly seen phantom school teachers and other residents who have been known to grab visitors' legs or pinch their ankles. Some visitors have also reported seeing a floating red light inside the buildings, while other visitors have reported extreme cold spots throughout the mine and an eerie feeling in various places of the town. Number 5 on this list is Father Urbane Grandier. Father Urbane Grandier was born in 1590 in France and lived until 1634. He became a priest in the town of Loudon in 1617 and was a priest right up until he was burned at the stake in 1634. That's right guys, Father Urbane Grandier's story takes an ugly turn when he's linked to making some serious deals with the devil. Urbane had some negative rumors start to circulate around him in 1629 when he was being accused of sleeping around with a lot of women. It was even thought that he was the father to a son of a married woman, however that was never 100% proven. The slander surrounding his name reached an all time high when in 1632 allegations of demonic possession started to form. A group of nuns began having very strange and vivid dreams with Urbane. Urbane appearing in them. They also started acting very funny and not feeling like themselves. It all started with Mother Superior Jean de Agnes. It's written that, unfortunately for the tortured nun, no amount of penance kept her dreams at bay and soon the other nuns followed in her footsteps. This plague of nightmares swept its way through all of these nuns and they all reported having Urbane in their dreams. The nuns started to fling accusations at Father Urbane Grandier and said that he'd gotten a demon to possess them. The demon that most people link to this possession is Asmodeus, who's a prince of demons, a demon that represents lust. That being said, a bunch of other demons were tied to this possession as well. Zabalon, Iskaren, Astaroth, Gresil, Amand, the list goes on and on about the possible demon or demons that Father Urbane Grandier sent down to haunt these nuns. Considering his character was already getting called into question, it wasn't difficult for people to believe that he'd called upon Asmodeus to do his evil bidding. A trial took place following the reports, but the verdict of guilt was swift and after some extensive torture, Father Urbane Grandier was put to death by being burned at the stake for making dealings with the devil. Number 4 on this list is from a reddit user called Macalla Mary. They tell a very interesting story of how their friend got possessed by a demon in a newly purchased house and the ramifications of that. I think they do a good job telling this story so for the purposes of this video I'm going to quote their post. When I was in high school my friend moved into a farmhouse. That house had a barn and a basement with stairs that led to nowhere. The previous owner killed himself in the barn because, and they put this in quotations here, the resident told me to. When moving into this house my friend would never step into the barn. Not once would she even walk towards it. We thought it would be fun to have a seance because we were young and stupid. We had the candles and everything. I was sitting next to Katie, the one who lived there, and all of a sudden, when asking if whoever was there could show themselves, Katie then squeezed my hand so hard. The candlelight wavered and she turned her head so slow to meet my eyes. 
What she said I will never forget. Let's go to the barn. Someone's there who wants to talk to us. I let go of her hand and stood up. My other friends there turned on the lights and she blinked at us. What happened? To this day, she can't remember that night. A week after our seance, her dad was found in that barn. He shot himself and in his letter he said, I'm sorry, I had to listen. As if something had told him to do it. This is a true story. It could have been coincidences back to back but it will always scare me. So that's a really interesting story and it reminded me of a tale that we talked about on this channel previously. In Scotland, many centuries ago, the settlers of the area defied a witch by taking over her land and not upholding the bargain that they'd struck with her. They eventually went on to kill her. This caused this witch to haunt the area and most specifically the barn that was there. Now we don't know where this place was and I would find it an overwhelming coincidence if this happened to be the same Scottish barn, but I wouldn't be surprised if a similar story is what caused a demon to haunt this place. Sadly, I couldn't find out exactly who the demon was in the place the reddit user described, but it's possible that it has been there for hundreds of years, preying on anyone who enters its lair. Number 3 on this list is the demon Dagon. This demon was prevalent in possessing people during what we call now the Luvenir's possessions. This was a series of demonic possessions that occurred at the Louvenier's convent in 1647. In this instance, 18 separate individuals claimed that they had been possessed by a demon. This all started with 18 year old sister Madeline Bavent. She was the first victim of these demonic possessions and was the first one to come forward about her story. Up until that point, her life had been very hard and she was often mistreated growing up. If what she claims was actually true, then that mistreatment carried over into her adulthood as well. Father Thomas Boole was the current leader of the convent and succeeded Father Matthew and Picard for the title. Father Matthew and Picard had died earlier that year. However, it was said that both men were responsible for having demons possess these nuns with Father Picard's spirit being present during the proceedings. It was reported that these two men took Sister Madeleine Bavent to a witch's sabbat and when they were there, married her to the devil and had him perform sexual acts with her. This was accompanied by the disembowelment and murder of two other men that were present at this ritual. Madeleine referred to the devil as Dagon and said that that was the name that he had given to himself. After Madeline came forth, so did a bunch of other nuns as well. The count finally got up to 18 of them who had come forward and they all told a similar tale. There were also reports of these nuns speaking in tongues, contorting their bodies and levitating just as somebody might if they were possessed by a demon. Public exorcisms were held and the entire town showed up to watch as these nuns were exorcised of the demons that had been forced upon them. Father Thomas Brule was in the thick of it now and there was nothing to save him from being burnt at the stake. However, it's also interesting to note that Madeleine Bevent was also sent to the dungeons to live out the rest of her days. I'm not really sure the logic behind that decision considering she was the victim of Father Thomas Brule and also the demon Dagon, but I guess they did things differently back then. Number 2 on this list is the demon Riga. This story comes from another reddit user. They say that they don't remember any of it but this happened to them when they were only 2 years old. Apparently one evening this person, when they were only 2, was lying awake in bed and they started screaming at the top of their lungs. Now this isn't completely uncommon for a two year old to do, but what happens next is. I'm going to quote their post here as they say, I got off the bed and started running in circles while screaming and crying in terror. It was not a nightmare since I was awake and I was not playing nor demanding anything since I was just scared out of my mind. Nothing like this had ever happened before. I was the only child in the house. This went on for some random time at night and until dawn. It would only stop at dawn. I did this every single night, non-stop, for six months." End quote. Now that is definitely a strange thing for a two year old to be doing and quite demonic if you ask me. The parents knew that this was a big problem. Their child would claw and bite at them whenever they tried to calm him and they weren't sure how to handle it. Eventually they decided that going to a priest was the right thing to do but even they couldn't find the answer. They apparently visited as many priests as they could but still the problem persisted. That was right up until one priest, while performing a ritual on this child, managed to extract some information. It turns out that our reddit user was possessed by a demon and that demon's name was Riga. They couldn't get a whole lot more information, however they did learn that Riga was an inhabitant of not only the child, 
but also the home. The parents understood exactly what this meant and wasting no time at all, they moved houses. This clearly was the problem because the second that they got to a new residence, the demon of possession, Riga, ceased and their baby, our Reddit user, was calm. Sometimes these demons will only possess us for a time and when they get what they want, which in this case was for these people to leave their house, then they'll also leave. Number one on this list is the demon Balbareth. This demon was rampant in possessing people in the Aeon province possessions. Similar to some of the other cases that we've looked at today, this pandemic of possessions made its way through a convent of nuns. Clearly, these nuns really had it rough during the early 17th century. The first report to come out came from Madeleine de Demandalx. She was an aristocrat who joined the Ursuline convent at Marseille in 1607. It wasn't long before she'd reported to the mother superior that she actually had an affair with father Louis Gofferty, who was also at that convent. The mother superior was obviously shocked at this news and thought it best to remove Madeleine and send her to Aya. This was to get her away from Father Gofferty and distance her from the scandal. It was when she got to her new location though that she started to notice the symptoms of demonic possession. In 1609, Madeleine started to exhibit all of her classic telltale signs. This included convulsions, foaming at the mouth, speaking devilish languages, reacting strangely to religious paraphernalia. These symptoms spread like a disease to all of the other nuns that were close to Madeleine and similarly to my other entries on this list, you immediately had a bunch of nuns that were now demonically possessed. These nuns were hit hard with these demonic possessions as well, with a lot of them speaking a voice that wasn't their own. The church responded swiftly and started performing exorcisms as best as they could. Most attempts though were unsuccessful. Successful. However, it was during one of these exorcisms in 1910 that Father Gofferty's name was thrown into the mix. Madeline claimed that he seduced her and brought her to a demonic ritual. This ritual was used to summon the demon Balbareth, which then possessed Madeline. Other nuns started to make the same claim and soon Father Gofferty's name was completely run through the dirt. During a session of torture, he confessed to the crimes and was sentenced to death. This case of a demon possessing a group of nuns was the first one in France and set the precedent for the other two that I've previously spoken about. Coming in at number five, we have Ribisol. Ribisol or Rubisol is a folklore mountain spirit of the giant mountains, a mountain range along the border between the historical lands of Bohemia and Silesia. This demon is the subject of many different legends and fairy tales throughout German folklore. Legend has it that Rubisol is a giant gnome or mountain spirit. With good people, he can be friendly, teaches them about medicine and gives presents, but if someone disobeys or disrespects him, his revenge is severe and can be deadly. He sometimes plays the role of a trickster in folk tales. The origin story of Ribisel comes from pagan times, and he is known as a fantastic lord of weather of the mountains and is similar to the Wild Hunt, which are a group that roam the sky during storms and is an omen of disaster. This demon has the ability to change the weather drastically. He can send rain, lightning, thunder and snow from the mountain to the lands below. Ribisol takes the appearance of a monk in a grey frock, holds a string instrument in his hand, which is known as the storm harp, and walks so heavily that the earth shakes around him. Others believe the demon inhabits that of a large bear and wolves to blend in with the other animals on the mountains. In the area surrounding his mountain, there is a large botanical garden named after the demon, named Ribisol's Garden. In the Czech Republic, local fairy tales say that Ribisol gives sourdough to people and invented traditional regional soup named Kaiselo. There is also a mountain named Kotel which means cauldron. When fog rises from the valley at the bottom of the Kotel, people say that's when Rubicel is cooking the Kaiselo soup. To this day, this demon's legend lives on. Coming in at number four, we have Adank. Adank or Afank is a demon originating from British, Welsh and Celtic mythology. It's said to look like a beaver, crocodile or dwarf like demon and are about 7 feet long and weigh around 250 pounds. They prey upon those who are foolish enough to enter the lake it lives in. This demon once lived in Lynn Bafog or in Lynn Lion Lake and it can be lured out of the water by a woman and once this happens, Adank becomes powerless. There are some stories of this demon being destroyed. One tells of a man dragging the beast out of the water to slay it. Another says it was lured out of the water where it eventually fell asleep and was bound in chains and slayed. But many believe this demon still roams in the lakes of Europe. The Adank is a solitary predator that builds dams to create smaller lakes, but still a part of the larger lake it lives in. Once they find the right place for a habitat, it's their territory and theirs only. Anything that comes near the lake or the adjoining rivers becomes this demon's prey. The Adank hunts its prey by floating just under the surface of the water, waiting for its next meal to approach, and 
when it does, they attack with a bone crushing bite. And once they have their prey in their mouth, the Adank then drags them under the water and goes in for the kill. They wait for the prey at their most vulnerable and takes advantage of that. Like a beaver den, the Adank's lair can only be accessed from below the water's surface, but it is truly hideous sight because they use the remains of its victims for decoration of their habitat. And the stench of decay lingers all around the demon's lair. According to many historical writings between 1382 and 1410, it describes the mass destruction of Adank and how he can cause massive flooding. And one time in particular, the floods caused all the original inhabitants of Britain except for Dwyfin and Dwyfach, who went on to find new race of Britons. This demon is recognized by many throughout Europe and the world and is mentioned in many different books and TV shows. In at number 3 we have Piccolus. Piccolus is a demon from the ancient inhabitants of Prussia, described as an angry and evil spirit, with the appetite for human blood. Piccolus and Patalo were gods in the pagan Prussian mythology worshipped by the old Prussians. Most researchers believe both these gods were the same person, and were in charge of the underworld and the dead. This demon was first mentioned in 1418 by Bishop of Warmia in a letter to the Pope and chronicler Simon Grunau. In a letter to the Pope and chronicler Simon Grunau, who provided more details about Piccolus. According to Simon, Piccolus was one of the three gods betrayed on the flag and coat of arms of King Wideruto and worshipped in the temple of Rikioto. He appears to look like an old man with a white beard and white headdress. He was scary and ruthless god of the dead. This demon would haunt and taunt the living if they disobeyed the pagan priests or buried the dead without proper sacrifices to the gods. Many other medieval writers believe in Simon's descriptions of the demon. In another writing, the Sadovian books, it mentioned two beings, Peckles, the god of hell and darkness, and Peckles, Airborne spirit or devil. The same bear is also found in the church decrees of 1530. Many believe these two demons mentioned are just extended descriptions of Piccolus. Caspar Heinenberger and later authors attempted to reconcile the accounts provided by Simon Grunau and the Sadovian book. In the 17th century, Christoph Harknock and Matthias Pretorius testify that people still believe in this demon, and many believe Piccolus is in fact the devil. In a number two, we have Bifrons. Bifrons is from the Earl of Ginistan, with six legions of demons under his command. Command. He teaches sciences and arts and has knowledge of gems, woods, and herbs. This demon has the ability to change corpses from their original grave into other places, sometimes putting magic lights on the graves that appear like candles. He first appeared as a monster but then changed his shape into that of a man to blend in with earthly people. Bifrons was originally the Roman god Janus and is often referred to as so. In ancient Roman religion and myth, Janus is the god of beginnings and transitions, also of gates, doors, passages, endings, and time. He is also well versed in astrology and planetary influences, as well as geometry, herbology, mineralogy, and botany. He is usually depicted as having a monstrous appearance along with two faces, due to his ability to look into the future and the past. The Romans named the month of January in his honour. Janus presided over the beginning and ending of conflict, and hence war and peace. The doors of his temple were open in a time of war and closed to mark the peace. As a god of transitions, he has functions pertaining to birth, journeys, and exchange. Janus had a major presence in religious ceremonies throughout the years and was ritually invoked at the beginning of each one and heavily honoured on many different occasions. Bifrons is mainly in charge of moving bodies from one grave to another, while hellish demon Muma takes over the souls. Accordingly, Bifrons has 26 legions of Ginnistan's army under his command and is the 46th spirit of the 72 Solomon imprisoned in a brass vessel. And finally in at number 1 we have Krampus. One of the most popular demons coming from Europe is Krampus. He is a horned half goat, half man beast who terrorizes children throughout the Christmas season who have misbehaved. Assisting Saint Nicholas, the pair visit the children on the night of December 25th each year, and Saint Nick rewards the well behaved children who have been good all year with gifts, while the badly behaved ones on the naughty list get a visit from Krampus and receive punishment from him. The origin of this demon is not directly known, but many believe this demon goes back centuries and originated in Germany, and since 1984, this demon has become known globally. Since the 19th century during the Christmas season, many Europeans will exchange greeting cards featuring the Krampus demon. The Feast of St. Nicholas is celebrated in parts on Europe on December 6th, and the evening of December 5th is known as Krampus Night, where the wicked hairy devil appears on the streets where he visits homes and businesses, wreaking havoc on unsuspecting humans. Many people believe Krampus has multiple appearances, but the most common is that he is hairy with black or brown fur, has hooves and the horns of a goat, as well 
well as long pointed tongue hanging out and sharp fangs. There are festivals all throughout Europe hold to celebrate Krampus, while many dress up in elaborate horrifying costumes that resemble this demon. In the aftermath of the 1932 election in Austria, the Krampus tradition was prohibited by the Dolphus regime and the Christian Social Party. In the 1950s, the government distributed pamphlets titled Krampus is an Evil Man. Towards the end of the century, Krampus' popularity rose, and the festivals began and continue to this day. Young men dress up in Krampus costumes and roam the streets, frightening children with rusty chains and bells. Many of these festivals take place in Austria, Romania, Bavaria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Croatia, just to name a few. We've all heard about Santa, and kids are constantly told if they have bad behavior, they will get coal for Christmas. But many don't realize that this has come from the legend of Krampus. This demon has become a global figure and is depicted in many horror films and has become a part of American pop culture. Well, there we have it. I will see you in the next video. Wolpertinger. The Wolpertinger can be found in Germany and is a mysterious creature that roams the alpine forests of Bavaria. This odd looking creature isn't particularly large or vicious but can be incredibly scary due to the fact it is made up of different body parts of various animals. It has the head of a rabbit, the body of a squirrel, the legs of a pheasant and has antlers, fangs and wings. Legend has it that if you are brave enough to try and lure the Wolpertinger in to see it for yourself, you need to bring salt with you and a trap. It is said that if you sprinkle salt on its tail, you can supposedly catch it. Also, if you prop open a sack with a spade and light a candle inside, the demon will be attracted to the light, and once he's inside the sack, you remove the spade and trap him. But be very careful, because if they feel threatened, they can attack, and they are extremely quick. The creepiest thing about this demon is that some people have hunted down various woodland creatures to create their own stuffed wolpertingers to keep, sell them to tourists, or give them to hotels or inns to put on display for all to see. So if you're planning a trip to Germany, I would definitely steer clear of the forest in Bavaria, you wouldn't want to come into contact with this demon creature. In at number 4 we have Tatzel Worm. The Tatzel Worm is a huge man sized worm or snake with a feline face and a reptile tail that usually lives underground in the Eastern Alps in Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Italy, Bavaria and Austria. The only time you may get attacked by this hideous creature is if you disturb it or threaten it while it's burrowed. It is believed that this demonic creature is extremely venomous and can attack you with its poisonous breath, and tends to make a high pitched hissing sound when attacking their prey. So if you ever hear that nail on a chalkboard like sound, I suggest running the other way. The name Tatzel Worm isn't traditionally used in Switzerland. They usually refer to this demon as Stolen Worm or the Dragon of the Mine Tunnels. The Stolen Worm may also be interpreted to mean a serpent with short, thick feet. An early description of dragon sightings in Switzerland was seen by Johann Jacob Wagner as early as 1680, and then illustrated further by Johann Jacob Schuster in 1723 and referred to as Schuster's Dragons. The cat headed serpent with black grey body and no legs was said to to be encountered by Johann and Thomas Tinner at a place locally known as Howellen on the mountain of Frumsen in the barony of Alsax, Switzerland. It was alleged to measure seven feet or more in length. Residents in the neighborhood were complaining that their cow's udders were being mysteriously sucked on, but the incident stopped after this creature was killed. Another account of this demon was described as a four legged cat faced mountain dragon by Andreas Raudner as something he encounters in 1660 on Mount Wangersberg in Sargensenland, and when it reared up on its hind legs it became as tall as a man with boar like bristles running down its back. A 70 year old man named Johannes Egerton came into contact with this beast and said when it exhaled its breath, the man said he was overcome with dizziness and a massive headache. The naturalist Carl Wilhelm wrote in his book History of Dragons of the Alps in 1887 that these creatures have died out by now but to this day the Tatzel Worm Phantom legend lives on and many people still believe these demons remain. In at number 3 we have Black Shook. The Black Shook may be the most terrifying of them all and definitely the deadliest. It's a huge black dog with evil red or green eyes that roams around the countryside of East Anglia. If you ever come 
in contact with this demon creature, you'll most likely die or at least become very ill. Even just looking in the black shuck's eyes directly means certain death. The black shuck is referred by many as an omen of death if ever seen or came in contact with. The name shuck derives from the old English word skooker, which translate as devil, fiend, and to terrify. In Littleport, Cambridgeshire, it's home to two different legends of black dogs, which many believe are linked to the black shuck. One account refers to the story of a huge black dog that haunts the area after being killed rescuing a local girl from a lustful friar in pre-reformation times, while the other story tells of a black dog that haunts the A10 road after its owner drowned in the nearby River Great House in the 1800s. In May 2014, a large dog was excavated at Layston Abbey by Dig Ventures, and many believe it was the remains of a black shook. Dig Ventures came out and said they don't believe the remains were from the black shook, stating it was only two feet tall and was around the size of a mastiff. Carbon dating of the bones indicated the dog was said to be from around the 16 or 1700s. Many people have reported sightings of the black shook, and even to this day, locals believe this demon is still roaming around England. One local woman said she had seen the creature one summer morning in the 1950s when she returned home from dance near Cromer. A Suffolk man said he had seen the dog one evening on the marshes near Felixstowe, and another account of a woman who was cycling during the 1930s. One winter night, the woman was riding her bike home after making a delivery when she was followed by a huge dog, and no matter how fast she pedaled, it seemed to effortlessly keep up to her before suddenly vanishing into thin air. The Black Shook has also been seen many times in pop culture, like in the hit TV show Teen Wolf, the 2019 movie Annabelle Comes Home, the 2020 video game Assassin's Creed, and even referred to in the 1999 novel Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. In at number 2 we have Basilisk. The Basilisk is an extremely dangerous being. It is a legendary reptile that is referred to as a serpent king, who can cause death with a single glance and is believed to be able to breathe fire. This snake-like being is not very big but is highly venomous and can kill in an instant and leaves a wide trail of venom behind. The Basilisk is quite different from a normal looking snake and is named King because it is seen to have a crown shaped crest on its head. One of the earliest accounts of the demon comes from Pliny the Edler's Natural History, written in roughly 79 AD, where it's described as a monstrous cow like creature and all who beholds its eyes fall dead upon the spa. The only thing that the Basilisk fears is a weasel. It is the only animal that can face and attack the demon snake, and apparently the weasel's urine is the Basilisk's kryptonite. It can also be killed with the crowing of a rooster, and many travelers would, and some still do, carry a rooster when they venture into areas where it was said that the basilisk lives. Some people have speculated that accounts and descriptions of cobras may have given rise to the legend of the basilisk demon. Cobras can maintain an upright posture and are often killed by mongooses, and the king cobra have a crown-like symbol on its head. Several species of spitting cobras have the ability to spit their venom from a distance, often in their prey's eyes, so they have many similarities to the basilisk. So if you're ever in southern Europe, I would beware of this monstrous snake demon. And finally in at number 1 we have Balbus. This demon tends to reside in areas of Lithuania and is basically the boogeyman on steroids. It is a dark demon who will come and kidnap misbehave. The Balbus has piercing red eyes, long thin arms, wrinkling fingers, and the most terrifying face. This demon creature stands almost 7 feet tall and their body appears like a large skeleton covered in black leathery skin. They also have extremely sharp claws and usually pounce on their victims from above. Sometimes they use two handed weapons, but still have the ability to fight off their opponents with their claws, teeth, and horns. This demon likes to hide under carpets or inside dark crevices of your house before appearing and snatching the child. The Balbus is devious, and will stop at nothing to make sure they are victorious in everything they do. Their more subtle sadism and stealth sets them apart from every demon on this list, and they like to capture their targets for later torture as opposed to immediate bloodshed. In many places like Italy and the Eastern Mediterranean, the Balbus is portrayed as a tall man wearing a heavy black coat with a black hood or hat which hides its face. Sometimes parents would loudly knock under the table, pretending that someone is knocking at the door to make their children behave. It is also featured in a popular Italian nursery rhyme, saying, who do I give this child to? I will give him to Balbus for a whole year. This tactic is used by many parents throughout Europe to make their children who are misbehaving fearful of getting the wrath of Balbus and in turn making them behave better. Many believe that the popular boogeyman was actually inspired by this demon by the fact that he likes to kidnap during the night, hide in darkness, and frightening children into good behaviour. The boogeyman is a term used to instill fear in children, and the Balbus is the most terrifying demon of them all. Number 5 on this list is Dirk Grossman. This demon is very similar to Slenderman and is just as dangerous. Slenderman Wiki says, It is a supposed mythical creature associated with woodcuts carved by an unknown artist in the 16th century Germany. Said woodcuts portrayed it as a tall, disfigured man with white spheres where his eyes should be 
be similar in appearance to the Slenderman. Dirk Grossman was commonly described as a fairy of the Black Forest who abducted bad children that entered the forest at night and would stalk them until they confessed their wrongdoings to a parent. The appearance of this demonic creature makes people believe that it could be related to Slenderman in some fashion, like a dark and twisted cousin or something like that. However, it seems as if Der Grossmann is only native to Germany, or at least the forests there are the only ones where reported sightings have been. Be very careful if you end up walking around in a German forest by yourself. Number 4 on this list is the Werewolf of Moorbach. Just that name, the Werewolf of Moorbach, sounds super menacing, like a scary creature out of Lord of the Rings or something like that. This is no fantasy fiction though, this is a real legend. Europe Diary says, A soldier running away from the Russian army with some other deserters stopped at Whitlich on his way to Alsace, his home. They wanted to grab some requirements from a farmhouse they spotted, but ended up killing the farmer and his sons on getting caught. The farmer's wife is said to have cursed the soldier so he would turn into a beast every full moon. Eventually, the news spread of a violent beast and the folks of Moorbach were successful in killing him later. A candle burnt always at the spot where he was buried as a reminder and warning. However, one night in 1988, the candle went out and the officers at the US airbase at Moorbach apparently saw a huge wolf-like figure within the parameter. A chase followed but the military dogs were not successful in combating the creature. The candle was re lit after the incident and the story was recounted numerous times since then. Now how much of it was true and how much of it was imagined? It might as well have been the imagination of the three security officers at the airbase, probably bored or in need to tell a new story. But then again, some of the other officers apparently years later insisted that what they saw was true. This is the big story that everybody always thinks about when referring to the Moorbach werewolf, but there have been other sightings since this incident as well. People have even found the carcasses of dead animals that have been absolutely ravaged lying in the forest. Now these animal carcasses could have just as easily been caused by an actual wolf or a bear or something, but considering the frequent sightings of this werewolf, it's fair to wonder. The candle apparently still burns at Moorbach, and while it's lit, the people believe that we should still be be protected. But if it ever does go out, then be very careful of the Morbach werewolf. Number three on this list is the changeling. This demon or demons in this case is very strange in the way that they can attack. Typically their targets are mothers of newborn babies or the babies themselves. It all started from an ancient legend in Germany where the mother of a newborn baby realized her child would not grow or gain weight. Both of the parents were very worried and looked for ways to help. They heard of this magical spring where, if they dunk their baby in it, it will either heal their child or their child will die within 9 days. Considering their child would die anyways if its growth was continued to be stunted, they really had no other choice than to try the water and hope that it healed their baby. The mother left with her child, but while she was walking to the spring, her child on her back grew heavy. She turned around to look at it, but it was no longer her baby. Where her child once was was a grotesque demon creature that resembles nothing from this planet. She panicked and threw the demon thing into the water she was nearby. At that point, she thought that her baby was dead. That she had inadvertently killed her child by throwing that possessive demon into the water below. But when she returned home, she found her child happy and healthy with its ailment cured. So in all honesty, I don't really understand how this demon operates. How is it possible for her baby to have been with her, then change into a demon, but then reappear with no demon at her home? It's possible that maybe this demon creature can assume the form of newborn children and that's what happened here. Maybe the creature assumed the form of her child, tricked her into bringing it with her on her journey, but before it could attack, was found out. Comment down below your thoughts on the changeling and how it actually operates. Moral of the story though, if your kid turns into a grotesque beast thing, then there's probably something wrong with it. Number two on this list is Lorelei. Lorelei isn't your typical scary looking dark demon. This creature is far more cunning and hides her hand for as long as possible before she strikes. Culture Trip says, according to German folklore, atop a steep rock on the Rhine River, there once lived an exquisite nymph named Lorelei. She dressed in white and wore a wreath of stars in her hair. Not only was her physical beauty astounding, but the size 
Siren sang a song so haunting and hypnotizing that no sailor could resist her aura. Enticed by her song, legend has it that no sailor who tried to reach Lorelei ever returned. Instead, they would meet their final fate by crashing against the dangerous rocks. Today, a statue of Lorelei watches over the treacherous stretch of water near Sank Gorhausen. So many lives have been lost to this alluring call that Lorelei makes. Why she is doing this, what caused her to be there, or if she even is an actual demon are all questions that we don't know. I tend to think that anybody who sings to people hypnotizing them and then murdering them falls into the demon category though, but I truthfully don't know her exact origins. It's also hard to get an exact description of what she looks like as nobody has really been able to see her up close and lived. Just know that if you hear some mysterious Serious melodic singing when you're in Germany, don't go near it. And finally, number one on this list is the Marksman Demon. This is one of the most famous stories in German folklore and involves the literal devil himself. Fluent U writes, A master marksman finds himself unable to catch any wild swine or deer in the dark autumn forests. One day, he's approached by a mysterious peddler wrapped in a cloak that conceals his face. The peddler offers the marksman seven bullets with one condition. The first six bullets will hit whatever the marksman wants them to hit, but the peddler will choose the trajectory of the seventh. The marksman agrees. The marksman quickly earns himself a reputation as the best hunter in the village as he brings home wild boar after wild boar. He catches the eye of the prettiest girl in town, and they fall in love. But all too soon, the marksman uses up all his six bullets, and when he shoots the seventh, it goes astray and hits his love in the chest killing her. The peddler appears to the distraught marksman and reveals himself as the devil. Live a pious life, repent of your hubris, and you will be reunited with the girl after your death, the devil tells the marksman. The marksman tries, but he is overcome by desire for another girl in the village, and he marries her instead. One year to the day after his bullet pierced his original lover's chest, he is riding in the forest when he comes across a clearing where skeletons dance around cold flames. One of the skeletons the girls, waltzes with him all night, and the next morning the villagers find the marksman and his horse dead at the edge of the forest. I'm not sure what my guy was thinking by accepting those initial six bullets, guys. Also, how on earth could he think it would be a good idea to use them on deer? Like, you'd think that if you got a bunch of magical bullets that will hit literally any target, you save that stuff for things like demons or even the devil himself. Or just shoot five of your six magical bullets and then you never need to fire the seventh deadly one. I don't know guys, I feel bad that the devil decided to pick on him, but I think that my dude could have played his cards a little bit differently in this one. Anyways, at least we know for sure that the devil can in fact be found in Germany. Number 5 on this list is the Battlesk. The Battlesk is a beast in Italian folklore that is said to annoy the living hell out of the villagers it's nearby. Bestiarium says, In the Val Carmonica, a valley in the central Italian Alps region, there is a local celebration which is connected to a legend about a mythical monster. This monster is the Battlesk, a creature with a huge head and large mouth, adorned with two tiny horns and two brightly glowing eyes. According to the local legend, the terrible Battlesk lived in the woods in Andrista, a small village. Actually, terrible is an overstatement. It did little harm, but it did constantly annoy the locals. As punishment, the beast was captured as the locals used a beautiful girl as bait to trap and capture the lusty beast. It was fought by a hunchbacked folk hero. So they hold a festival for the demon thing every year. There's a parade and they get a costume for it made from goat skin. The whole village participates in it and it's a whole big affair that's going on. However, there are a few select elders who don't participate. Whilst everyone is out and about having fun, drinking, and making merry, this select group of elders is inside being very careful with what they do. Apparently, this group was around when this beast first came to being. They saw it firsthand, and they don't agree with the way that people are treating it. In their opinion, the legend has been thoroughly exaggerated, and this creature isn't as kind as everyone wants to believe. They are under the impression that constantly doing this year in and year out is going to anger the creature, and one year it will finally unleash its wrath upon the village. 
Now, no one knows if this is true or not, or if it's just a bunch of people being really paranoid. However, I would tend to believe the people who claim to have seen this thing firsthand, rather than those who are just looking for an excuse to get drunk. Number four on this list is Stryska. This is a demon very similar to a vampire that can be found in parts of Italy. Wikipedia says a Stryska is a usually female demon somewhat similar to vampires in Slavic and especially Polish folklore. People who were born with two hearts and two souls and two sets of teeth, the second one barely visible, were believed to be Stryski. Somnambulics, or people without armpit hair, could also be seen as one. Furthermore, a newborn child with already developed teeth was also believed to be one. When a person was identified as a Stryska, they were chased away from human dwelling places. During epidemics, people were getting buried alive, and those who managed to get out of their graves, often weak, ill, and with mutilated hands, were said to be Stryski by others. It is said that Stryski usually died at a young age, but according to belief, only one of their two souls would pass to the afterlife. The other soul was believed to cause the deceased Stryska to come back to life and prey upon living beings. These undead creatures were believed to fly at night in a form of an owl and attack nighttime travelers and people who had wandered off into the woods at night, sucking out their blood and eating their insides. Stryska were also believed to be satisfied with animal blood for a short period of time. Whatever version of the Stryska is proven to be correct, it really isn't good either way. They're either personally coming to kill and suck your blood, or they're indicating that we're about to die. The way that you protect yourself is pretty similar to vampires. Burning the body of one of these creatures or putting a stake through it are proven methods of getting rid of them. Also, for some reason, slapping it across the face with your left hand is said to help. Not sure if I want to be the one trying that method, though. Number three on this list is dragons. Now, I know that dragons aren't technically demons, but they are pretty bloody terrifying in my opinion, and for that reason, I think they deserve some love on this list. Italy has quite the history with dragons, and has had some pretty big ones in the past. Dragon's Wish says, One of the most famous dragons of Italian folklore is Tyrus, a wyvern that besieged Terni in the Middle Ages. One day, a young and brave knight of the noble house of Cittadini, tired of witnessing the death of his fellow citizens and depopulation of Terni, faced the dragon and killed him. The town, from that day onwards, adopted the dragon in its coat of arms and accompanied by a Latin inscription, Tyrus e Anis Dedurant Signa Teraminis, that stands under the banner of the town of Terni, honoring this legend. This is just the most famous legend of a dragon in Italy, but it doesn't mean that it's the only one. There have been other reports of dragons in Italy as well, and some of them have been very scary. At the end of the day, a dragon, in my opinion, is just as bad, if not worse, than a demon. If I had to go one-on-one -on -one versus a dragon or a demon, I might try my luck with the demon, guys, because there's no way I'm going to be able to survive the dragon. Number two on this list is the Lariosauro. This creature is an evil serpent living in one of Italy's big bodies of water, and it's said to be a servant of the devil. Yoaya writes, meet Lariosauro, Italy's own Loch Ness monster. According to Italian folklore, Lariosauro lives in Lake Como, which lies 30 miles to the north of Milan and is one of the deepest European lakes. In November 1946, two hunters claimed that they saw a huge animal resembling a reptile swimming in the lake. It had red scales and was about 12 meters in length. Upon firing their rifles, Italy's Nessie disappeared into the center of the lake with a hissing sound. The creature was named after Lariosaurus balsami, a prehistoric reptile whose fossilized remains were discovered in the lake in 1830. More sightings followed at the lake. 
1954, a creature with a round muzzle and webbed paws was spotted by a father and his son. Then, in August 1957, another monster was allegedly seen by natives. A month later, in the same year, an animal was spotted in the lake, this time whose head resembled that of a crocodile. The last sighting was in 2003, and it looked more like a giant eel. It's got tons of different forms, and no one knows exactly what form it will show up as next. One thing is clear though, it's guarding whatever is at the bottom of this lake. Some people think that the devil has some type of gate there, or that he's working on creating a gate. Until the gate is fully functional and ready to bring creatures from hell to our world, the devil has employed the capabilities of this underwater beast to guard it. This is all just a theory, but no one knows for sure, so we should probably do some digging pretty soon, folks, and figure out what's going on underneath the water. And number one on this list is the Ferocious Beast. I wish I had a more descriptive name for you guys, but that is literally what it has been called. The Ferocious Beast. This is a demon creature that resembled a wolf and was around several hundred years ago. An enormous animal similar to a wolf, it ate pets and children and terrorized Milan during the 1790s and the Milanese organized a hunt against it. After months, they killed the Ferocious Beast and displayed its body at the University at Pavia. But it's no longer there and has been missing for decades. Informal sources claim it was stolen, destroyed during World War II, or removed specifically by German actions during that war. So there are a lot of rumors that have circulated about what actually happened to this beast, but something that wasn't brought up there was that it still might be alive. Yes, it was killed back in the day, but now with this pelt mysteriously vanishing, people are thinking that this thing could have come back to life. Now this would have been with the help of the devil himself. The legend says that the devil realized how deadly this beast was to us humans. He saw some serious potential here and didn't want to let it go to waste. So he finally decided to come back and claim the pelt and then bring this thing back to life, but as a servant of the devil. Now its main goal is to serve as a demonic hellhound and claim as many bodies as it can before it's killed once again. Although killing it a second time is going to be a lot harder considering now it has demonic abilities to go along with it. And coming in at number 5, the Pacetto family possession. During the year of 1981, home in Lee, Massachusetts was riddled by paranormal activity that surged through every room in this house. Lee and Dale Pacetto, an average hardworking American couple, along with their two children, endured occurrences that nearly destroyed them, literally. The devout Catholics lived peacefully in the house that had been their family home for decades. It wasn't until two years after moving in that the demonic signs started showing. On March 19th, Mrs. Pacetto began receiving nightly visits from a white orb that took the shape of a non-threatening young boy who spoke in a very soft voice. Doesn't sound that bad. While the apparition was gentle, the Pacettos felt that they should rid their home of such supernatural entity, and a priest eventually came in to perform a ritual. Mr. and Mrs. Pacetto believed their troubles were over after this, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, this only caused more demonic occurrences to start. In place of this sweet ghost boy grew an unearthly creature hunched over and dressed in a black robe. Scary. Mrs. Pacetto claimed that the specter would say vulgar and nasty things, growling, saying it called itself the Minister of God. It wasn't just the verbal attacks that were happening, however, no. During the sleepless nights, Mrs. Pacetto claimed that she suffered claw marks both on her back, stomach, breasts and face after being dragged around the bedroom. Mr. Pacetto attested this and said that he watched in horror as the bed levitated above him, Mrs. Pacetto on it. Terrifying, dude. Refrigerators were ripped from walls, metal bookcases turned over to the floor, and in one case, a crucifix was even yanked from the hand of their 14-year-old son. The Pacettos reached out to medical professionals for help, but they rejected their experiences, calling them exaggerated. It wasn't until Mr. and Mrs. Pacetto turned to professionals Ed and Lorraine Warren, self-proclaimed demonologists, that were called to help. The Ghostbusters themselves. As the founders of the New England Society for Psychic Research in the 50s, Mr. and Mrs. Warren devoted their life to the supernatural. When the Warrens visited 
visited the Pesetos, they instantly detected signs of paranormal activity pulsing from the home. In a description eerily similar to the film Poltergeist, which came out the following summer in 82, Mrs. Warren says that she saw many small ghost lights move around the room until they combined to create a towering shadowy figure. A priest was brought in to perform the ritual. The basement apparently then filled with smoke during the exorcism, and when the ritual was complete, the Warrens deemed the house clear of evil. The Passetto family moved back in and reported no further activity since. And in 2004, the family moved out and on and left this once haunted house for someone else to deal with. I understand. Number four, Elizabeth Knapp. The possession of Elizabeth Knapp, October 30th, 1671 to January 12th, 1672, is a unique and weird one in the aspect that it was approached from a more scientific aspect than religious, and being of that time somewhat of a new methodology. Knapp's father was the servant at a household of Samuel Willard, a prominent reverend in the Church of Groton. When Elizabeth Knapp, a member of his own household, began to show signs of demonic possession, Willard took a carefully and yet scientific approach to the situation, which was rare for the 17th century Puritan. After these scary events took place, they could provide no explanation for her episodic fits. He declared that it was a case of possession. Throughout the entire process, he notes in his journal, Knapp seemed to have most violent fits when Willard was present beside her. Willard states that Knapp at first began to complain of pains in her body. She would grab certain parts of her body, such as her legs or breasts, and would scream out, talking about feelings of strangulation. She would even sometimes laugh to the point of hysterical fits, weeping or screaming out. Hallucinations followed shortly after the outbursts, and on many occasions she claimed to see two people constantly walking around her bed. Strange claims like this constantly seeing men floating above her bed as well. This happened particularly at night, including some convulsings on the ground. Willard then documented on the night of November 2nd, 1671, Knapp made a confession of meeting up with the devil. Uh oh. The old sign at the crossroads deal, huh? She stated that for three years, the devil had been meeting her, promising her money, youth, and the ability to see the world. She then claimed that he had presented her with a book of blood covenant, which was signed by other women as well. And on the night of November 28th, in which she had a fit lasting for 48 hours straight, she was in a coma state until she made the pact with the devil himself. Witnesses document strange deep voices and animal sounds coming from her. After Willard stopped entries to his journal, things get a little messy. It has been a historical mystery what happened to Knapp, as we are still unsure to this day exactly what remains of her. Was she tried and hanged for witchcraft, or simply disappeared on the promise of seeing the world? You tell me. Number three, like father, like son. Duxbury, Massachusetts. 2021, huh? A 19 year old man is charged in the death of his father. Apparently the boy told police that he was baptizing his father at a Massachusetts pond to exercise out his demons. Okay, modern times call for modern solutions, I guess. And this one, a modern weird one. Jack Callahan, the 19 year old kid choked back tears in court as he listened to prosecutors describe the moment divers pulled the bloated body of his father, 57 year old Scott Callahan, from a Massachusetts pond, lifeless. The young man told investigators that he and his father went to the pond around midnight after he picked up his father from a Boston bar. He says that his mother did not want the intoxicated ex-husband of the family home that night as he had been acting somewhat strange lately. After conversations from the son and father, Jack, feeling helpless and confused about his situation, tried to take matters into his own hands. He is now facing a murder charge in relation to his father's death and is still under investigation. Both the prosecution and defense say Scott Callahan had a long history of substance abuse and suffered from the aftermath of traumatic brain injuries and that from overuse of medicinal drugs might have taken the man's mind. According to Jack at the Pond, his father became combative with him, punched him repeatedly in the face, claiming that he had not been in control of his own body and was assured that his father wasn't really aware of what he was doing in the moment. The 19 year old then decided to baptize his father in an attempt to exercise the demon, which resulted in drowning him. That's a hard one to swallow. It's also got some biblical feel to it, you know? Father, son, bonding over paranoia. Scott Callahan was found in the water about 50 feet away from the shore in the pond, short time after the baptism and attempted exorcism happened. He was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. There is an open investigation on this one still, and the young man is sticking to his story. What do you think? Possession? Number two, Warren, Massachusetts. This New England tragedy was apparently what laid out the structure of the Conjuring movies. I'm terrified just reading that, and I guess 
we're going to find out why. 11 year old David Glatzel was only 10 when he reported beginning having hallucinations and delusions. From around 79 to 82, the boy's suffering worsened, causing severe trauma in the family. According to his family, efforts by Catholic priests and others to relieve the boy of what they said were multiple demonic possessions. Multiple. Things started getting interesting, however, surrounding the family after an aggressive, bloody confrontation in 1981. Arne Johnson, boyfriend of David's older sister, Deborah, stabbed his landlord to death multiple times in Brookfield. New England paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren later claimed that Johnson had actually challenged the demon inside David's body to leave the young boy and enter him instead. This guy's a hero, man. Unfortunately, a deadly one at that. That argument was the basis of the devil made me do it defense at Johnson's trial in Danbury with the superior court. The Warrens claimed that the man showed all signs of possession, including growling, speaking in strange voices, violent acts, and talkings of the beast. This is a wild case and sparked huge controversy in court after murder charges were forever changed with the claim that the devil made me do it would be lawfully excused. He was released from prison in 1985. And coming in at number one, the Dover Demon. Probably the most famous of all these cases. 17 year old William Bartlett claimed that while driving on April 21st, 1977, he saw a large eyed creature with huge sharp fingers and glowing eyes on top of a broken stone wall on Farm Street in Dover, Massachusetts. 15 year old John Baxter reported seeing a similar creature on Miller Hill Road the same evening. Another 15 year old, Abby Brabham, claimed to have seen the creature the following night on Springdale Avenue. Three in one night, huh? The teenagers all drew sketches of the alleged creature. Bartlett wrote on his sketch, I, Bill Bartlett, swear on a stack of Bibles that I saw this creature. And according to the Boston Globe, but according to the Boston Globe, some suggest that the creature may have just been a large foal or moose calf. Nah, definitely not. With wings and fingers like that? I don't think so. Police told the Associated Press that creatures reported by the teenagers were probably nothing more than a school vacation hoax. I don't know. It's been about 45 years since the sightings of the creature that came to be known as the Dover Demon and still remains one of Massachusetts' truly great mysteries and one of the world's great cryptic cases. Number five on this list is El Coco. El Coco is a demon that is said to specifically go after children living in South America. This is a story that is told to children all over the continent to ensure that they go to sleep when they're supposed to. Villains Wiki says, Coco is a monster who exists to enforce taboos and ensure that children sleep when told. For should children disobey orders to sleep, Coco is said to hunt them down and may inflict a number of gruesome punishments upon them depending on the story. Usually he's said to eat the children or spirit them away, never to be seen again. Coco may also emerge as a female known as La Coca. The two beings are seen as extensions of the same monster and as such, the Coca is little more than Coco taking a female guise and vice versa. Both share the exact same motives and terrible behavior. Behaviors. While a force of punishment, Coco is also an opportunist and is said to outright kidnap and devour any disobedient sh** he can find. This is seen as further proof that children should mind their manners and always obey their elders in case a lurking Coco happens upon them misbehaving and captures them for a nightmarish fate. El Coco, El Coca, really doesn't matter which one you get because they're both going to destroy you if you're a ch and you disobey your parents. Now this is probably just a story told by parents to frighten their children into doing what they want them to do. But if there is some legitimacy to this, then this is by far one of the worst demons in South America. To kidnap and kill little for not going to sleep when they're supposed to is pretty horrible. If I was a kid and I heard this story, I'd be so scared to go to sleep on time that I probably wouldn't be able to fall asleep on time. Thank goodness I grew up in North America and didn't have to deal with El Coco. Number four on this list is La Viodita. This demon is specifically out here hunting for the men. Max Gax writes, this is a common tale across Latin America, including Argentina. La Viodita is known as the Black Widow. She's said to be a beautiful woman, veiled and dressed in black from head to toe, who walks in the streets after midnight. She tries to get drunk men to her head 
house. If she succeeds, it's then and only then that she will take off her veil to reveal that her face is nothing more than the grotesque skull. The sight is said to be so horrific that the men are quite literally scared to death as the woman lets out a shriek of hair-raising laughter. For those that survive, they awake at dawn, usually lying in a puddle or covered by thistles and swearing to never party until late again. Let me tell you guys, I am the type of individual who likes to go out. In fact, I do it most weekends. If I was several beverages deep and some pretty lady takes her face off, that's it folks, I'm done. There is literally no more Nicholas Playlog after that. I have no idea why this demon does what it does, but it means that every Argentinian gentleman had better be on the watch for something like this when it flips over to 2 a.m. at the club. Also, no one has any idea what the thistles are doing there or why you're covered in a puddle. So clearly something pretty terrible happens after you pass out with this demon as well. Probably something that I don't even want to know about. Number three in this list is La Cocana. La Cocana, believe it or not, is a barn animal. Yeah, we're looking at a demon who is literally a barn animal here, folks. Pepe's Chile writes, In this Chilean legend, a woman deceived her family by being a housewife during the day and a witch at night. She would use potions to turn herself into various animals and play while her family slept, then use another potion to turn herself back into a human when morning came. One night, she forgot to make sure the children were asleep and they saw her turn into a sheep. As she ran off to play, the children wanted to imitate her and turn themselves into foxes. When they couldn't turn back into children, their cries woke their father. Seeing what had happened, the father threw all the potions into the river in a rage. When the wife came home, she couldn't turn herself back into a human and was doomed to remain a sheep forever. So you're probably thinking to yourself, great, the witch is no more, she's a barn animal now, what can she even do? Well, it's believed that this demon, goat, witch, woman is the worst omen that you can see in South America. Sheep are a pretty common animal, but if you happen to set eyes upon this particular sheep, then horrible luck will befall you and your loved ones. Terrible tragedies that you can't even imagine or don't even want to begin to think about. So, how are you going to know that you've seen this sheep when there are so many others in South America? Apparently, you're going to just know. Every demonic encounter that I've read about talks of people feeling that horrible sense of foreboding and a terrible presence. Apparently, something similar happens here. Time slows, and as you make eye contact with that demonic barn animal, you know that something horrible is about to happen. There's really nothing you can do to avoid this one. It's just sort of luck of the draw. Hopefully, La Cocana doesn't pick you. Number two on this list is Besta Fera. Besta Fera is absolutely deadly, guys, and one of the most visually striking demons on this list. TV Tropes writes, Besta Fera, translated to bestial beast, the Besta Fera is a horse with a human torso, believed to either be a servant of or the devil himself who leaves hell through cemeteries during full moon moon nights to brand people with his mark, which dooms them to hell. Some legends say that instead of marking people, its sight causes them to go insane, but only for a few days. It's also said that it roams forest areas in search of a blood-soaked red flower and that when he finds it, he disappears. Blood-soaked red flower. No idea what that is, and I don't think I even really want to know either, guys. This is not the creature that you want to run into if you're chilling in South America. This may even be the devil himself, for all we know. Artists' renditions of this creature are truly terrifying, and we don't actually have any photographs of the beast because anyone who gets close to it doesn't make it out alive. Stay away from Bestifera at all costs. And finally, number one on this list is the Wakafu. The Wakafu is a horrible demon that you can find in Argentina. Max Gax writes, This legend comes from the Mapuche people of Argentina and Chile. According to them, the Wakafu is a harmful spirit or demon. When they were introduced to Christianity, the Wakafu were said to inhabit people as well as being free-form spirits. They can alternate between a human and an animal form too. They're aimed to enslave the souls of the dead and they take great pleasure in spreading spreading diseases and killing people. They were said to come from the West and had no soul. They were said to enter our world as a consequence of battles with the Pilan spirits which resulted in the destruction of the perfect harmony of the world. They have the power to capture and enslave the spirits of the
of the recently dead if it is reluctant to leave the body and transform into a greater spirit. If they do manage to trap a spirit in this way, they can use them to hurt other people. In this way, the Wakefu have feared entities. Not only can they enslave your soul and rob you of an afterlife, they can use you to hurt others, perhaps even your own family and friends, and many feel this fate is truly worse than death. Now, what I want to know, folks, and I don't think there's any way to find this out without getting enslaved, but what does it feel like to be under their control? Are you aware that you're under their control? Do you recognize the actions that you're doing when you do them? Or are you just a mindless dummy who's a shell of your former self? Personally, if I ever was to get attacked by one of these things, I would prefer the latter. If this demon forced me to kill or harm my family and loved ones, and I was aware of what I was doing, then yeah, that is way worse than death. Trapped in your own mental prison, having to watch as you hurt the ones that you care about? It's no wonder this demon is so feared in Argentina and why the locals have tried to do everything they can to avoid it. Number five on this list is the Lacanon. These are tricky demons and if they approach you, then you need to be very wary. Wikipedia says, Delacanons are a race of elf-like creatures in Philippine mythology. In Visayans, they were believed to be handsome and beautiful creatures that resemble nobles and monarchs of the pre-Hispanic Philippines. They dwell on Delacat trees, hence the name Delacatnon, which literally means from the Delacat or Dacat tree. This mythological race exhibits sexual dimorphism, you know, the men having light colored skin and very dark hair and women having bronze brown skin and brown hair. Stories say that they have leaf shaped pointy ears, depicted in modern times as gothic like tall, handsome males and beautiful females. They dress in fashionable manner, live in the haunted house-like mansions, and try to fit in with mortal people. Some believe that the only way to Delacet, their dwelling place, is by entering the Delacet trees. These creatures abduct people and take them back to this world. They hold a feast for their victims and force them to eat the black rice that then puts them under their spell, making them their slaves. So that sounds like the actual worst. You get taken to their mystical land and then forced to eat this rice, which I mean I can only imagine is going to be something really gross, because then it makes you their slave. My question is, what the hell does becoming their slave even entail? Like, what is this world that I now live in, and what is it that I have to do here? I guess I'm in some evil elf-like hell or something, but that doesn't really sound like a great time. The biggest problem with this is that you need to be super vigilant, or else it's very likely that they could get you. If you don't notice those pointy ears, then mm, that could be game over, guys. Number four on this list is the Amalanhig. The Amalanhig are sort of like the Philippines version of a zombie. Myths and folklore says, in the Philippine mythology, the Amalanhig or Marinhig are flightless aswang that came back to life after death. They rise from their grave after failing to pass their power to a relative. Upon rising from the grave, these Amalanhig lurk in the woods and live as bloodsuckers. At night, they go to nearby villages to prey on the residents using their sharp pointed tongue. Aside from the Amalanhig of Aswang origins, some deceased humans could also turn into Amalanhig. These are people who died with unfinished business or were murdered and came back for revenge. The Amalanhig with unfinished business are relentless in pursuing the persons they have chosen to fulfill their goals. Avenging Amalanhig tickle their victims to death while sucking their life force. According to one legend a long time ago, before the Spaniards came to the Philippines, a chieftain ordered his priestess to create an army of warriors that couldn't be killed. These immortals were created by killing ordinary men and encrusting their bodies with dark soot, putting a strange pebble in their mouths and doing other rituals. After three days, they came back to life, but they were mindless, walking corpses that only died after accomplishing their task. They had me right up until I learned that they tickle their victims to death. Like, don't get me wrong, I still do not want to run into something like this, but I guess it's just hard to be scared of something that's gonna tickle me to death. The whole sucking my life force thing, yeah, that sounds like the worst. I don't want any part of that. But tickling? 
Really? We couldn't have come up with any other way of murdering people, guys? Number three on this list is the Pugot. I get serious Stranger Things Demogorgon vibes with this next demon creature. Myths and folklore says, in the Philippine mythology, the Pugot, which translates to the decapitated one, is a mythical fiend that's found in the Ilocos region. It can assume various shapes such as hogs, dogs, or even as humans. However, it usually appears as a black, gigantic, headless being. The creature usually resides in dark places or deserted houses. However, they especially like living in trees such as the Duhat, Santol, and Tamarind. Aside from its shape-shifting abilities, the Pugot can also move at great speeds, feeding on snakes and insects that it finds among the trees. It feeds by thrusting food through its neck stump. Although terrifying, the Pugot is relatively harmless. However, the creature is fond of women's underwear and steals them when they're being dried on a clothes line. The Pugot is also found in the Il Fuogo myth Tulod Nimputo, the self-beheaded, where he appears to the human hero. He was fed by the hero with chopped chicken meat that was mixed with blood. So I guess the good thing about this is that even though it has incredible power and speed and, and could be super dangerous, it chooses not to be. Well, unless you're a pair of ladies underwear, in which case you might be in for it. Actually though, what is up with these Philippines demons? They, I mean like they're just kind of plain creepy guys. Like we had the tickle zombie and now we have the headless Demogorgon panty thief. I swear that this legend was just made up by like some super weird guy just as an excuse for why their neighbor's underwear kept going missing. Number two on this list is the Batty Bat. This is a very dangerous demon and one that you do not want to piss off. Myths and folklore says in the Philippine mythology, the Batty Bat or Bangungot is a vengeful demon found in Ilocano folklore. These demons were blamed as the cause of the fatal nocturnal disease called Bangungot. They usually come in contact with humans when the tree that they reside in is felled and made into a support post for a house. This causes them to migrate into holes found in the post. The Batibat forbids humans from sleeping near its post. When a person does sleep near it, the Batibat transforms to its true form and then attacks that person. It sits upon the chest of its victim until he suffocates. To ward off the Batibat, one should bite one's thumb or wiggle one's toes. In this way, the person will awaken from the nightmare induced by the Bati Bat. Once again, guys, we just have one of the scariest demons here with also the weirdest caveat attached to it. To ward this thing off, we need to wiggle our toes? Like, are you actually kidding me? I mean, at least this one doesn't steal panties, I guess, so, I mean, that's a thing. Also, this one, unlike some of the others, is actually very deadly. You could easily die from this thing if you're unable to wiggle your toes, which would actually be rather hard considering you're going to be asleep when this thing attacks, you know, so it could be game over. I could totally see how if I was living in the Philippines, this thing would be one of my biggest fears. Like, I would exclusively be living in, like, a brick house or something. No wooden posts for me. And finally, number one on this list is the Ek Ek. This one had to be number one, and when you hear what it does and how it operates, you'll understand why. Wikipedia says in Philippine mythology, Ek Ek are bird-like human creatures. They are winged humans who search for victims at night. They hunger for flesh and blood. They're usually described as flying creatures that look like the menangle, but are unable to divide or split their body in the way that that one does. The Ek Ek is also associated with the Walk Walk because of some similar characteristics. The only difference between a Walk Walk and Ek Ek is that Ek Ek has a bird-like bill, whereas the Walk Walk has none. The Ek Ek can transform into a huge bird or bat at night to prowl in the form of. Similar to the Menangle, the Ek Ek looks for sleeping pregnant women. Then it extends a very long proboscis into the womb and kills the fetus by draining its blood. It's said that while this is taking place, a Ek 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 sound is often heard. The Ek Ek fools people into thinking that it's far off in the distance by producing a faint sound when it's actually really near. What the actual heck, guys? Most of these other demons are derpy dudes looking for underwear and tickles, but this thing, 
This is for real. Fetuses and blood draining and just, no, no, I don't want it. How on earth does the Philippines grow in population with these things roaming around? I'd be too scared of having this thing come attack in the middle of the night. And tons of people feel the same way. Many rituals and services are done to try to ward off these creatures. I hope that some of these work because if they don't, consequences could be dire. Coming in at number five, we have the villa. The villa are Eastern Europe's nymphs or mountain fairies who can be found living in hills and mountains. Some versions of folklore claim that the villa live up in the clouds, but throughout history these creatures are almost always spotted in the wilderness in all versions of folklore. These mysterious creatures are believed to have power over the wind, and they are credited with causing windstorms that can wreak havoc on the surrounding communities and urban structures. Those who claim to have seen the villa say that they appear as beautiful women who spy sparkle in dresses made of leaves and flowers, while others claim they are ghost-like creatures wrapped in long cloaks or rich blue robes. Unlike many of the creepy creatures who haunt the forests and homes of Eastern Europe, the villa are beautiful and feminine, but don't let their appearance fool you. While many believe they are helpful creatures, many people throughout Europe claim they are destructive and use their appearance for their gain. They are known to tempt men to dance with them, then rob and kill them, and then hide their bodies in the clouds or throughout the dense wilderness. These demons are incredibly strong and powerful and are known to end the lives of men who defy them or break promises. You will know that you are in the territory of the villa if you see deep rings in the grass. This is the sign that the villa has danced in one spot. It is said that treading on the rings will bring bad luck, so avoid them at all costs if you ever discover them in the woods. If you're planning a trip to the Eastern European area, I would definitely avoid camping or anything to do with the woods, due to many demons living and lurking in the forests around Europe. Many locals like to leave peace offerings for these demons, things like ribbons, fruit, cake, flowers and vegetables are often left on the hills where lighting is known to strike. When locals want to venture into the woods, they hope that these peace offerings will bring them luck and keep them safe from the villas. In at number four, we have Nekalave. The Nekalave is a horse-like demon from Arcadian mythology that combines equine and human elements, originating from the Orkney Islands in the Northern Isles of Scotland. Also as the origins in North mythology and British folklorist Catherine Briggs called it the nastiest of all the demons of Scotland's Northern Isles. This demon's breath was thought to wilt crops and sicken livestock, and the creature was held responsible for droughts and epidemics on lands even though it's predominantly a sea dweller. This demon could cause mass destructions for the locals across land and sea, which is why many believe it to be the most terrifying of all the demons throughout Europe. A graphic description of the Nukalave as it appears on land was given by an islander who claimed to have come in contact with the demon, but many accounts describe the details of the creature's appearance as inconsistent. Many believe they have many similarities to other sea monsters. This demonic creature is destructive to many humans and the environment, but it's believed throughout the summer months it is kept combined by the Mither of the Sea, an ancient Orcadian spirit, who is the only one that can control the Nekalave. Orcadian folklore has a strong Scandinavian influence, and it may be that the Nekalave is a composite of a water horse from Celtic mythology and a creature imported by the Norsemen. As with malevolent entities such as the Kelpie, it possibly offered an explanation for instance that islanders in ancient times could not otherwise understand. This demon has terrorized the sea and land throughout Europe for centuries, and according to Orkney resident and folklorist Walter Trail Dennison, Nekalave means the devil of the sea. Many people think this demon is only able to thrive in the waters, but can in fact roam the land for some time. According to an encounter with this demon, on land it appears to have the torso of a man, which is attached to a horse's back. It has no legs, but large arms that can reach the ground. When it's back in the water, it is unknown what it looks like specifically, but it resembles a large, hideous sea creature. In a number three, Kosci. Kosci is often given the nickname of the immortal or the deathless and comes from popular Russian folklore. The story goes that a spell is cast on a man which prevents him from being killed. He hides his soul inside nested objects to protect it. The origin of this demon is unknown but contains elements from the 12th century pagan leader Khan Konchak, who is recorded in the Tales of Igor's campaign. Over time, a balanced view of the non-Christian human Khan, who dates back to the 12th century but may have been slightly distorted by Christian Slavic writers. By the 18th century and likely earlier, the legend of this demon had been appearing in Slavic tales. This demon has the ability to cast sleep spells on their foes and can only be broken by playing on enchanted gusli. Depending on the tale, he has different characteristics. He may ride a three or seven legged horse, may have tusks or fangs, or may possess a variety of different magic objects like cloaks and rings. It is positive though that this demon possesses many magic powers, making humans frightened of coming in contact with this demon. The humans who are the most 
scared of this demon are young women because he tends to menace women with his magical powers. There are various versions of the Kochi demon and have been made into terrifying fairy tales all over the world in places like Greece, Albania, Croatia, Serbia, Hungary and Lithuania. Many people who are soon to be wed are terrified that their soon to be wives will be taken or killed by Kochi, so many of them stay hidden with their beloved until their wedding day to ensure the safety of their soon to be wives. Many stay away from Europe for their weddings and honeymoons because of this demon to ensure the safety of their loved ones. In at 2 we have Strigoi. Strigoi is a terrifying demon from Romanian mythology and a troubled spirits that are said to have risen from the grave to prey on the living. It is believed that they have the ability to transform into an animal, become invisible and gain vitality from the blood of their victims. Bram Stoker's Dracula has been the modern interpretation of the Strigoi through the historic links with vampirism. One of the earliest members of historical Strigoi was Gio Grando Alalovic from the region of Istria. This villager was believed to be the first real person to be labelled as a vampire because he was referred to as a Strigoi. Gio is said to have terrorised his former village for 16 years after his death. Eventually he was decapitated by the local priests and villagers to let the terror subside. Johann Weikard von Valvesor wrote about Gio's life and afterlife in his extensive work The Glory of the Duchy of Carnoila when he visited Kringer during his travels. This was the first written document on vampires in relation to the demon Strigoi. An 1865 article in Transylvanian Folklore by Wilhelm Schmidt describes Strigoi as nocturnal creatures that prey on infants and haunts the nearby villages, stalking women waiting for them to give birth so they can sneak into their home and steal their babies. In 1909, writer Franz Harman mentioned this demon in a book, saying that the peasant children from a village in the Carpathian Mountains started to pass away mysteriously. The villagers began to suspect their recently deceased count turned bloodthirsty demon was the one causing these mysterious deaths. A common way used to identify the Strigoi was to place a young child dressed in white on a white horse near the graveyard at midday. It was believed that the horse would stop at the grave of the suspected demon. And finally, in and one we have Kulm King. One of the scariest demons from Europe is that of the Kulm King. This creature comes from Estonian mythology and is the evil protector of the forest, eating children alive when they bother forest spirits. Not only do they prey on children, but they terrorise anyone that comes in contact with them, being able to possess people, turning them into devils and causing havoc as lesser personifications of evil. They like to haunt and terrorise grown ups who happen to cross paths with it while walking the dark forest around Europe. It is the restless ghost of an unholy dead and you run the risk of being harassed everywhere in the wild because the Com King doesn't have a fixed haunting place. To make it even worse, many believe this creature has the ability to go through the body of humans and if this happens that person becomes evil, thus creating a legion of killers. This terrifying demon can appear in many different forms including a dog, a cat and a haystack. Some of the more sinister and possibly accurate descriptions of the Kong King are they look like a demonic polar bear, white sharp spikes running down their backs and sharp teeth and claws that cause death immediately. Yes this demon is a protector of the forest but to us humans it is similar to the devil and takes no prisoners. If you're venturing in the forest I would be very careful to not encounter this creature and if you do be respectful of the forest and its habitat if you don't want to escape alive. Not only does this demon frequent public places but can also enter private places without invitation a trait that can be found in other folklore monsters, such as vampires and certain types of ghosts. Anyone who enters the woods in Eastern Europe worries if the Kong King could be lurking nearby.